Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are uh, in these final days uh, more and more being treated to a humanistic gospel which urges us uh, to, uh, by holiness and personal dedication and devotion and obedience and by personal surrender and by giving and by sacrifice, by service to make ourselves acceptable to God. And uh, I don't want that opinion to influence where we are in our present study. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege to meditate upon your word. We are so keenly aware of the responsibilities that we face in handling your word, not deceitfully. May the Holy Spirit guard the time sealing truth to our hearts and stripping away error that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We've been studying together in the uh, epistle to the Philippians verse by verse, and in our last uh, study together, we were around the 13th verse of the fourth chapter, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. We'd been looking at the concept of setting our minds uh, on the finished work of Christ, of settling our affection on things above, not things below. Uh, the power of his resurrection, uh, had he not risen from the dead, uh, we would not have been made righteous. Uh, that, we, that we are have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Uh, the fellowship of his sufferings, uh, had, he, uh, had we not been buried with him and uh, crucified with him and buried with him and raised with him, then we wouldn't be able to stand before God without spot and without blemish. And how the walk of the believer ought to be in the reality of what God has, has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's it's regrettable that more and more the church of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, uh, or that is the outward appearance of, of that church, has been to build personal holiness uh, by personal uh, dedication, sacrifice, rather than to walk in the finished work of Christ. And the urgency of the last two chapters has been that we might settle our, our minds on what God has done for us in Christ. This is uh, one of the things that makes this epistle so marvelously intriguing. The, the text has told us that we ought to set our minds on the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, and that shouldn't uh, be twisted around to to uh, uh, to mean some kind of human and personal service by which we might gain merit with God. We do not hear much today a uh, a proper emphasis on the power of God in the finished work of Christ. In the tenth verse, we saw that the. Uh, the Holy Spirit have Paul declare that he was uh, encouraged and he rejoiced in the fact that their, uh, the, the Philippians, their continual care for him, it, it had an opportunity to flourish again. And I suggested looking at that verse that, that we're not, not reading some kind of, of, of rebuke uh, by God the Holy Spirit to the Philippians. Uh, some kind of uh, condemnation uh, although that's uh, that's kind of the way that many of the commentators take that verse and I've I've, I've pointed out that I'm not asking anyone to agree with any any position 
uh, that comes from this uh, pulpit, if you want to call it that. Now, I am absolutely convinced that the Holy Spirit is encouraging these Philippians. He's encouraging and, and comforting these believers, this body of believers, in the fact that it was their uh, characteristic habitual action to be concerned about the Apostle Paul. But they hadn't had an opportunity to, to carry that out. They hadn't had an opportunity to express that concern. The urgings then uh, in verse 11 and 12 were that the Holy Spirit, uh, I believe the, it is not the Holy Spirit's desire that, 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 we, that we somehow reach the conclusion that the concern of the true believer's heart was to receive a gift, but that the concern of God's heart uh, and the concern of our hearts ought to be for that which is good for the other Christian, for the other believer. In verse 12, we found that, that Paul had learned what he learned from the Word of God, not as much from the experiences through which he passed, and I'm sure he learned much from the experiences through which he passed. But that's not what we're seeing right in our present context. Uh, I believe what God wants you to know that you learn primarily from His Word. Now, I'm in no way suggesting that that's not uh, by any, I'm not by any means saying that God uh, never uses experiences in our lives to teach us anything. I'm not suggesting that at all. What I'm suggesting is that the Word of God is the revelation of truth. And as I walk, I see how that that truth works. But I learn what God wants me to know because God has told me in His Word uh, that which is important uh, for me to know it may not be important for you to know at this time and what he's teaching you at the present time may not be important for me to know uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all ministry by the Holy Spirit it's very particular and it's customized to our personal uh, I guess what you'd say is it's, it's the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives is customized to our personal position in Christ. Position in the sense of, or the stage of maturity uh, where we are, what we need. I guess that would be the best way to put it. The Holy Spirit ministers to our needs. And we're talking about spiritual needs. It's not always about material stuff, folks. So, uh, I don't believe the primary learning process in the Christian's life is wrapped up in the, in the experiences which come our way. It's, but rather, it's the time that we spend in His Word. I learned from the Word of God. I think that's what the verse says. Paul says, I am instructed both, both to be made full and to be hungry. I know what it is not to have an abundance. And I know what it is to have an abundance. I know what both are like. And yet, though that be the case, uh, Verse 13, I am constantly empowered to do all things through the one who constantly empowers me. I believe that's the, about the best paraphrase that, that, that we could, uh, I mean, in just looking at the original text, that's how I would translate the verse. That's what the verse says. That's what the verse says. But we got a little bit of a, a problem here. I think that we can totally, absolutely, and completely misconstrue that verse, mishandle that verse. It's easy to do. I don't think that that means performing great feats of human strength. I, I'm persuaded that many Christians would like to bring that verse down to that level. 
you know, like the the Lord empowers me to 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 uh, to stay on a bull for eight seconds, or the Lord empowers me to climb a mountain, or He empowers me to run 90, 90 yards for a touchdown, or maybe it's a business inter enterprise. And to me, those things highlight how much our minds are away from the Word of God. I mean, how much we want to take a verse like this and use it to ensure the success of an investment or, or a business venture or, or any other activity of human experience, even if that experience is in the context of Christian service. I hear Christians use that verse that way rather than using it in the frame of reference in which we're seeing it. And I've pointed out, folks, the importance of context is it is it is vital. It's a vital interest. It's it's in our best interest that we observe context. We cannot ignore context. Ah, I'll admit the verse does look like a, a source of of superhuman strength, and I I suppose that some of uh, you know of the uh, you know, the lifting yourselves up by your own bootstraps theology can be encouraged by, you know, such a concept. But not once, folks, in 30 plus years has anybody ever told me, you know, I don't like Bible study, but I'm empowered to do Bible study through him who empowers me. You know, nobody's ever told me. You know, that I really find it difficult to spend time in prayer, but I'm empowered to do that by the one who empowers me. Now, I'm not saying that people haven't done that, but they've never said that to me. Without exception, any time a Christian has used it in conversation with me, it's been tied to some kind of human achievement, some human attainment, you know, to a sports event, you know, a business venture, you know, or a health situation, but never, never in a realization of the person and the work of Christ, you know, in a wrestling with the Word of God, in a concern about the application of some scriptural truth as it's worked out, you know, in, in their personal life. You know, I'm sure there are missionaries, you know, they've never done it to me, but I'm certain that someone you know, has the testimony, you know, of a, of a missionary who's used that verse. And that's, that seems to be a little closer to the context. Now, it seems that, that what this verse is saying is that, is that the only enablement I know is from the Lord. Yet, though Paul knew that to be true, the Holy Spirit says, the Philippians did a good thing. They did well to share with Paul, to communicate with Paul to fellowship with Paul, to have partnership with Paul, to, meet, to communicate with Paul. You know, however you want to translate that word, it's a primary word, you know, uh, that for we, we have communion. It's a primary word for communion or fellowship. Uh, to, to fellowship with me in my pressure, in my affliction. You Philippians know, perfect knowledge, you know, that 10 years ago, I left Macedonia and preaching the gospel, not one single church fellowshiped with me, communicated with me in the matter concerning giving and receiving. And folks, I, I'm going to suggest that what the Holy Spirit is saying is you Philippians, you Philippians know, Pro others probably know it, but the Holy Spirit, but surely you Philippians know that, that over 10 years ago when I left that, that particular area in the preaching of the good news of the finished work of Christ, not one single church fellowshiped with me concerning giving and receiving. And the word translated concerning in your authorized or your King James uh, is is your Greek word logos, a word that most of you are familiar with. It's the word logos. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. 
you know, and, and out of Lagos comes our word uh, legizomai that uh, I've pointed out, referenced that quite often. The first command we're given in Romans 6, 11, to reckon ourselves dead to sin but alive unto God in Christ. That's legizomai comes from the word Lagos. Uh, calculating uh, of facts, just counting it to be true, uh, reaching a, a conclusion based upon those facts. You fellowshiped with me concerning giving and receiving. That is, in the matter of, in the word of, in the logos of, okay? Okay? Giving and receiving. And pro probably most of you, if you, if, if if not all of you, at some point, you've heard many messages on giving. But i got to be honest with you. I haven't heard any messages on receiving. That's, that's a fact. I've heard a tremendous number of messages on giving and the responsibility of Christian uh, giving, but nobody's ever given me uh, uh, a message on uh, receiving no, nobody's ever given me instruction on receiving I find that uh, somewhat odd I mean I, personally I find it difficult to receive I, I wouldn't want you to know I had a need anyway you know uh, insidious you know that human pride but when I left to preach the good news, that's been over 10 years now, not one single church communicated with me about giving and receiving, okay? Or about the word of giving and receiving, the instruction concerning giving and receiving. Except you only, you Philippians. In fact, when I left your area and went to a very wealthy area, Thessalonica, you supplied my need not just once but twice okay twice they met his need twice it's it's important that we see that it was God who made sure that both Paul and the Philippians got what they needed the fact of the matter is that God used the believers at Philippi to do that and the Philippians now had some credit to their account. You know that no church communicated with me except the Philippians. No church communicated with me, fellowshiped with me in the word of debits and credits except you only. I mean, that wouldn't be a bad translation. In fact, there may be a a translation that in fact uses those words and the problem that faces us in our present study is what is the word of giving and what is the instruction of giving and receiving and there are many Christians I'm persuaded who would give more than they do that they, they've got it to give and they'd give more than they do uh, financially if they knew that it was going to be used for the Lord and not for other silly purposes. But it isn't just a matter of giving. It's the matter of receiving. And I'm persuaded that God is saying that it's never one-sided, folks. There is no possible way that the Apostle Paul, in God's uh, financial record-keeping, was obligated to the believers at Philippi or vice versa, that there was an even exchange you know, of one hand washing the other, you know, the, you know, it's, it's the back scratching thing. You know, I, I scratch your back, uh, you scratch mine. I do this for you, you do this for me. And if I do this for you, you owe me this such and such or whatever, which is absolute pure nonsense. I hate uh, Christian backsliding with a passion. Uh, or, uh, I hate Christian uh, back scratching. Well, I hate Christian backsliding too. But I hate Christian back scratching with a passion. Paul didn't know 
the Philippians anything. The Philippians didn't owe Paul anything. They certainly didn't owe, not, none of them owed God anything. And the only thing that God owes any of any of them, owed, owed any of them, or owes us, is just being faithful to his word, which he, he that's all he can do. And I, I'm probably skirting around the main point that I that I, I'm hoping to get across here, but but uh, it's never one sided. It's never one sided. I had a necessity, says Paul. Okay, it was an absolute necessity. Okay, and so we want to think about that for a moment. Now, I don't know what Paul's necessity was, and you don't know what Paul's necessity was, and I don't think anybody else in, in, in this world knows what Paul's, uh, Paul's need was. I don't know what it was, but apparently the Philippians met it and did it twice. They met it twice. Twice, he says, while I was at Thessalonica, you satisfied an absolute necessity. You know, I'm not persuaded from the text that they knew, that they knew, the Philippians knew that it was an absolute necessity. Or, or that they even knew what it was, but the Holy Spirit said that they supplied it. And now the Holy Spirit goes on and says, not because I desire a gift. Now, I don't know what the gift was, and neither do you. Okay. It, but it is most interesting that God doesn't tell us. Okay, so we're inclined to always make it money or personal things, you know, personal belongings, uh, material things. I mean, folks, listen, it might have been a word of encouragement. I don't know. It might, it might have been a, a passage from the word of God. I don't know what the gift was, but Paul needed it. And I am persuaded that many, many times our need is not money, okay, or clothes or food, okay. Uh, it may be, in fact, a precious truth from the Word of God that you hadn't realized or you hadn't seen before. And I am unwilling to make this gift to mean just money. I don't know what they sent to Paul. It may have been a, a letter with truth from God in it. Maybe that's all it was. I don't know. You can take the word necessity and you can always make it mean human uh, needs in, in money and, and clothes and food or whatever. But I think that the word means more than that. Okay? I am not in any way suggesting that, he, that Paul didn't have a need for money or that he didn't have a need for clothes or pencils or notebooks or, or whatever. Okay? I'm simply saying, okay, let's don't limit this to just material stuff. He had a need. God supplied that need. And God, in turn, credited the Philippians with the fruit. And God didn't tell us what this was, his need was, that they met twice. And Paul says, I don't desire the gift, not at all. God is always supplying my needs, Paul says. Paul knows that God is always supplying his needs. Okay? He's always supplying my needs. He's always supplying your needs. What I long for, says the Holy Spirit, is the fruit to your account. Okay? The fruit to your account. Dearly beloved, whenever there's a true gift to God, there's both giving and receiving to think about. Okay? There's the gift, whatever that might be, and there's the fruit. It's a two-party situation. It's never one-sided. And they now know, and probably this is the first time that they know, that it was an absolute necessity. Okay? And the concern of the Holy Spirit I mean, it was his concern that, that both the necessity, the need being met was, was a concern, obviously, by God, as well as the fruit Okay, it was a twofold process. I don't know how to tell you folks to invest your time to, you know, and your money, your, your resources, uh, how to invest that for the Lord. I see in this context the fact that Paul did not 
desire a gift, okay? Although Paul obviously had needs. He obviously had needs because he, you know, why didn't he desire it? Because he knew that God would supply those needs. He wasn't asking for a gift. His concern was for the fruit that would have been reckoned or accrued to their account. Okay? That's what we're seeing in the text. So that seems to me to be the Holy Spirit's position in the matter of giving and receiving. In the matter of your giving to this fellowship, it's been the it's pretty much been the policy of this ministry right from the start to not emphasize the need, you know, for of this ministry. Uh not emphasize that too heavily because I too believe God will supply all our needs in Christ. It, it, it is of great concern to me that we continue to fellowship as a body of believers. If that's what the Lord wants, he knows all our needs. And it is of tremendous concern to me that we not kill ourselves from a human standpoint, trying to keep this ministry going if that's not what the Lord wants. Okay? So really, it, I mean, there's no real money drive going on here like we, you know, so often see elsewhere. I believe not only from my standpoint, but from the standpoint of the elders that I've been privileged to serve with here, I believe that our concern is for the fruit that may abound to your account. I'm greatly more concerned about the message that's taught, the way the Word of God is handled, the attitude that we have toward one another, the love that we show toward one another. You know, folks, to me, the, the financial side of this thing, is, the financial side of anything, is a dreary thing. And it's my great concern that we understand this process. Nobody here ought to give any money to this ministry for a tax deduction. Okay, if that's the only reason you're giving it, I mean, there's there's other ministries you can give to. Nobody here ought to give out of, a, a, you know, because they feel that it's a Christian obligation to give. You know, you certainly sh should not ever give out of guilt. Okay, or the sense of gaining merit with God. The matter ought to be one of fellowship that's centered within fellowship. The, 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 the reality of fellowship, of partnership. Only you Philippians partnered with me in the matter of giving and receiving. The Philippians were not lacking in, in addressing Paul's need because God had credited fruit to their account. That fruit, is we know that fruit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, so on you can't have that folks when when somebody badgers you for money and out of a sense of human guilt you give them money law can't produce love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such things there is no law What I want you believers at Philippi to understand is the fellowship that we have in, in this, the, the communion in this, the partnership in giving and receiving. Okay, I, I don't have any necessity. I had it twice, in which case God used you, Philippians, to, to meet that need. And you didn't even know it. And my concern was not that that need be fulfilled because God's going to do that. I know God is going to do that. So the Holy Spirit's revelation here is that God's concern is the fruit that abounds to, 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 to your account, says Paul. Uh, you know, is that a reward in heaven? I, maybe. I don't know. But, but I don't think that that's, that's it. That may be. I'm certain that our rewards in heaven are going to be, they're going to be as much a surprise to, to me as, as they are to you. But I think that the context is saying that that fruit is now. It's accruing to your account now. Okay? 
If you're giving folks out of a sense of obligation, a sense of guilt, a sense of responsibility, a sense of, if that's, if that's why you're giving, and I'm not, not just referring to, to giving to this ministry, giving to any, any ministry, or giving to any person, okay? If, if, if your whole mindset is one of, of that you're doing it uh, because you believe that it's going to earn you points with God, or that, or you're, so you're doing it out of, of a sense of, of guilt or obligation, or don't do it. Just don't do it. If that's the only reason that you're given, don't do it. God's concern is that you bear fruit. And, and folks, this is not just limited to giving or receiving money. The point is, I don't want you to have the attitude that God is interested in, in how much you give and how often you give or if you give at all. But God is supremely interested in the fruit that accrues to your account. Don't, folks, don't look at this passage as just hearing Paul say, not that I desire a gift. Okay, The Almighty God is saying to your heart and mine, not that I want your gift. I long for the fruit that may abound to your account. That's what God is saying in that passage. If you can't give in to the reality that, that giving, if you don't, dearly beloved, please don't miss the connection, the relationship, the marriage between giving and ministry. And don't look at it as just, well, it's always got to be something material or physical or temporary. Okay? God is, his concern is the fruit that abounds to their account. I long for the fruit that may abound to your account. That's what God is saying in this passage. If you can't give in that context, okay, in fellowship, partnership, communion with other believers and, and with God Almighty in the person of Christ, then I don't think the giving is, is scriptural. God's concern is the fruit that abounds to their account. As far as God is concerned, no matter where Paul is sitting, Paul abounds. I am full, he says. Having received of, of Epaphroditus the things which, which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Dearly beloved, the fruit, the heart of God was always concerned about the Philippians. Whatever the Philippians sent. I don't know what they sent, Paul. But what was important was that it was an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable and well-pleasing to God. If whatever you do in service, in, in testimony, in money, and other material things, in prayer, in fellowship with other Christians, if it can't be as a sacrifice of worship to the God of all grace, I'm saying if you can't offer it in in worship to God, were that it is acceptable and well-pleasing to Him, then don't do it at all. Don't do it. That ought to be the attitude. God's going to supply all our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A, uh, a synod... S Y N O D. That is a. It's a, It's basically a, the simple definition is, it's an assembly of the clergy. It's usually uh, convened in order to decide an issue of doctrine. It can get the the debates can get quite heated. These these have uh, occurred occasionally throughout the church history. The Synod of Dort, D O R T. It was a it was an international. Synod. It was held in Holland in uh, 1618, 1619, just, just a little over 400 years ago, 402 years ago. It was held by the Dutch Reformed Church. 
and the purpose of this of the synod was to settle the controversy that arose over Arminianism, which is a, a man-centered, not God-centered uh, uh, faction of Christianity. And uh, look, just call it what it is, it's law, legalism. And it's more than interesting that the organized church, as it was known in that day, they unanimously rejected Arminianism and they established what is known today as, big surprise, the five points of Calvinism. Now, don't blame that on Calvin, okay? He'd been, he'd been dead for 200 years when this happened. The amazing thing is that over the years since the Council of Dort, that's 402 years today of this year, 402 years ago, it is, uh, it's, it's virtually the unanimous opinion of the organized church today that the five tenets of Arminianism, not the five tenets of Calvinism, but the five tenets of Arminianism were correct. And that the findings of, of the Council of Dort were not. And as a result, we were born into that false legal system of human merit that you always hear me referring to. And, uh, and so we're more and more being treated to a, uh, a gospel that's really not the gospel at all, which, which urges Christians to make themselves acceptable to God by, by whatever means, by, you know, holiness, personal sacrifice, surrender, you know, that whatever. And so we see this epistle closing on a note of giving and receiving that is not based on that world religious system of human merit. It's what we've seen throughout the entire epistle, dearly beloved. It's not surprising that the in this epistle to the Philippians that, that we would see that in the in the closing of words of the fourth chapter in, in some of the closing remarks and statements by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul to the Philippian church it's not surprising that we would see this that in the matter of giving and receiving it is not based on law human merit As we go on and continue, I, I was hoping to, to wrap this up and finish this uh, this up, and uh, I, I'm not quite able to do that. Uh, so we'll wait until next time, uh, folks. Just know that I love you all dearly. I'm praying for you constantly. Rest in Him. My prayer, folks, for you you people is that you would come to that the soothing grace of God's love for you would heal the, the wounds, the, the abuses that's been heaped upon you by that world religious system based on human merit. Until next time, rest in Him, and thanks for watching.